Hi guys, um, welcome back. Um, so our next debate is, called, is titled, How are sales leaders managing the development of junior sales resources in a hybrid working environment? So I would like to uh, welcome to, uh, as our speakers, um, Arthur Jones, the CEO of The Art of Standing Out, Amir Reiter, the CEO of Cloud Task, Ben Eddy, the Managing Director of Mobile Practice, Keith Willis, the President of Core Management Training, and we do have another speaker um, who's having a bit of technical issues, but she will be coming soon, uh, Karen Dunn-Squire, the CEO of Proficiently. Okay, guys. Right, welcome. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us today, guys. So the, uh, the question is all about how are leaders managing the development of junior sales resources in a hybrid work environment? I want to just uh, kick off uh, with this question and just see where we're at now and um, what you guys um, think or your comments are to this debate question. Uh, let's start with you, Keith. Well, good morning. <laughs> Happy to be on. Uh, I think that managers really are struggling with this. It's so different. Managers are trying to make up their mind whether they're going to be in the field with the representatives, are they going to work with them virtually? And then a lot of times their time gets sucked up a lot of sales meetings and they're doing a lot of other things than managing their teams. So as a consequence of that, they're struggling with these changes and aren't really sure. And then I think also some of the skills that are needed are a little bit are a little different because it's just a lot more hybrid selling that's going on. And as a consequence of that, sales representatives are struggling and managers, frankly, aren't getting trained to even be able to coach to those skills. And so as we change in this new world, you see a lot of representatives that are leaving companies and going to other company, companies to see if they can find not only those skills, but ways to be successful and those that are successful are doing quite well sorry I, um over to you ben what, what's your take on this uh, well i can i can only but heartily agree with keith there um mm -hmm. i think that the challenge is, is that the context has completely changed as we all know you know from that being in a being in a those sales managers often grew up in a place where every, the teams were all together in a physical location. The manager was there, the team members were there. So there was that, you know, that, 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 that context is completely changed. And as, as, as Keith quite rightly said, is, is that um, they don't really have the skills, um, you know, and uh, they're the kind of the jam in the sandwich, if you like. So there's a lot of pressure coming from, a, from above them. And there's a lot of pressure coming from below, you know, in terms of escalations. And I think, I think Gartner says that, you know, less than 50 percent of managers actually have the knowledge skills and courage to actually train coach on the job um their their team members and the other problem is is they just don't have the opportunities so they're relying heavily on the the crm systems that we have available today to manage their activities which is fine in terms of managing the quantity of activity that they're doing you know, and, and also there's really important things such as bookings and revenue, but those are all lag measurements. You know, uh, they struggle, and coming back to what Keith said, is, is they struggle to observe and coach in the moment so that those new team members uh, actually can develop their communication skills. And then the last point I just want to add is, is that this is a new generation of, of, of workers, and they are they're used to communicating in different ways, as, as indeed are our customers. So we're joining our customers, at, you know, whilst they've gone through a 70% of their own sales journey. So it's so that moment of 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 contact with the of the customer is so important to be able to create this uh, point of trust, insight, and differentiation, so that you can say yourself, the company, and the product or service. So you know, and so what are those moments of conversation that create that potential friction in the buying cycle? You know, and how can we improve our skills at those clutch moments? That's a real challenge for managers who are not always out in the field observing actually the performance. Okay. Amir, you uh, you actually run a um, you know two 
uh, big, large call centers. And uh, how, 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 how are you? I do, actually not, I do not run two large call centers, but thank you. I run a marketplace. Okay. <laughs> um, two marketplaces. I did have, so. uh, I did have a, uh, an outsourced sales company with 267 people. And some people had phones, so you could call it a call center, but it was a big office. Um, but yes, um, I'd like the question go many different directions because obviously every industry is different. I think overall, it's easy to answer the question by saying poorly because most companies are missing quota. Most companies are cutting their workforce. So I think overall, they're managing it poorly because if they were doing a good job of it, we probably would be hitting numbers. Um, and then even the question itself, like if we focus on SaaS, you know, are, are we talking about a VP of sales managing an SDR or a VP of sales managing an AE or a VP of business development? Because I, I think, I think the trouble happens where companies hire a VP of sales, a sales leader, and then a junior could be considered an SDR and they don't necessarily have that skill. So sometimes it's a mismatch of, of just training and skill sets internally. Um, and very few companies, I think right now, um, I think there's just an explosion of, of sales tools and technologies and companies that often go through the procurement of sales tools rarely have the actual trainers in place to actually do checks and balances to make sure that people are improving. Um, so I think, you know, I think there's a lot of distraction out there when it comes to training. And what I've noticed is that um, a lot of junior sales leaders will take it upon themselves to find communities um, like the Sales Rebellion or, or, or Rev Genius to self-educate and i think that those junior sales leaders that are entering slack communities on their own and being proactive about training are the ones that are kind of moving ahead uh in my opinion um mm -hmm. i'm not sure if i answered this super clearly but i'll leave it at that okay all right we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that i think yeah, that was a very interesting point there uh uh alpha uh good morning good morning um, you know, I think uh, I, I agree with everyone, but I, I'll build on what Amir just said. And I think it's it's so true. The you know, we've all been the, the pandemic turned the world upside down and we're having a hard time turning it right side up. But I think those people in the field in the hybrid work environment that are taking the onus, onus on themselves to become the best their best sales practitioner by joining Rev Genius, by by joining Slack communities, by by learning the skills that are generally the skills that help you succeed, are not relying so much on the leadership to download those skills, but going out and getting them themselves, because there is a gap. And I think Ben said that um, the gap between a, a sales leader that's 45 uh, working with a SDR that's 24, there's a generation gap and there's a learning gap in terms of their aptitude for technology. They're, um, they come from different places. If you're Gen Z and you're working with a, a, a young boomer, there's a gap in how you execute it in the field as a boomer and how as an SDR you enter the, the, the business of, of selling. You come with different values and um, your different expectations. And there's, I look at it, I'll say it this way. I'll, I'll, I'll shorten my answer to say, we, we rely a lot on IQ. We leverage that with TQ, which is technology. And we're not, I think, as concerned as we should be with EQ and mm -hmm. understanding the relationship that we have with our downline reports that we want to teach up. So those downline reports have good relationships with the customers that they're in service to. So e EQ becomes more important, but is underserved as an element of success. Hmm. Could oh. I just come in there a second? Well, um, yeah. uh, very quickly. So I think there's also a, uh, an, a misalignment of expectations between us boomers and, and this new generation in terms of, you know, us, you know, we're expecting them to an SDR to be smashing the phones. I spoke to an SDR recently. I said, how many what sort of activity rate is it? Well, I made one phone call last month, you know, and I was like, my eyes nearly popped out of my head. But I think there's a, 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 and a you know, they're communicating in, in, in completely different ways. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but there's definitely a, a difference in expectation. 
Oh, Ben, I, I'd love, Leon, if I can, I, I was going to jump in and Ben just okay, go ahead. I just have to say it quickly. So I think that we have this phenomenon in the culture where, like, I, I call it whatever generation it is, that they have the power to almost have, like, this cancel culture. And, and I feel like hashtag cold calling is dead was almost created by the young generation to avoid the phone. And I feel like all these highly publicly, like, highly funded companies allowed it to happen. And it was, like, kind of shocking. Because they were getting paid, and like this is actually part of the reason why I founded Cloud Task, right? I was working for NetSuite, getting paid 180k a year, working a day a week. Um, I had SDRs at the company who made zero meetings for me, getting paid 100k, and that's when I moved to Columbia and opened up a shop because I was like, "This is huge waste here." So to Ben's whole comment, it's like there's a whole camp that has had the power to be like hashtag cold calling is dead. They avoid work. By the time they're getting fired from their 100k SDR job, they have another one, right? And then you have the other camp. To Arthur, Arthur's point, and what I mentioned that actually are um, taking it upon themselves to to listen to people like Justin Michaels and other guys, and, and actually crush the phones, and those guys will win. But then, kind of right about that, it's an interesting generation. I never saw that before, where they can actually start making statements that everybody believes it's true. Um, but you know, cold calling is dead. I, I built a company from zero to six million in revenue with no funding on cold calling. Okay, I mean, I think I think so. There's two different points here which I'd like to address separately. First of all, I think what what we're talking about with these communities and stuff and this self learning, that has not changed. That is not, you know, I mean, I think there's just now a we have a we have a community of way of encompassing that. But I've been making sure I've learned, been learned self learning and teaching myself above and beyond what I've been taught from day dot one. I've been doing that for 25 years. So I think that is one of the things that a, a top performers will do because they want to stand out. They want to be the best. They will take it upon themselves to learn. So I think that, and I think that, that that's never going to change. You know, you're going to have the people who are just going to sit there and wait to be spoon fed. And you're going to have the people who are going to, you know, take that and take and go and learn more. But I think one of the things that I wanted to pick up at a point, a point was um, on this, do we are, there are different, we're dealing with a different generation and they communicate in a completely different way. The fact that they're not making calls, does it mean that they are, that they're not doing their job? Are we, I mean, are we paying people for their time or are we paying people for results? I think that's a, that's a, that's, that's really a great question. And, I think that, you know, omni-channel is a thing, right? Um, and depending on what generation you come from, you have a different point of view of how you engage with customers. And, and I forget who said it earlier. I mean, if, if I want to engage with my clients on Snapchat or TikTok or Facebook or any one of those channels where I have a built a brand and I have a presence and I have a, a, a savvy about how to engage with people there, is that less will that be a less successful venue for engaging with customers than picking up the phone and, and pounding a hundred calls a day? That, that's a question, not, not, not as much a statement. So, yeah. so I, <clears throat> I guess I look at it as to me, that's part of a lack of expectations. And it goes back to the original question around managers and expectations. So regardless of what generation you're in, the job is a job. There are certain things that you need to do. And as an organization, you may move on the channel. One of those channels is, yeah, you got to pick up the phone. You got to call people. Might you do some social media? Might you do some other things? Yeah. But at the end of the day, you need to close the deal. You need to make some money. So you're either doing that or you're not. And so if the manager's not inspecting that, or there's not an expectation to make so many calls a day, then that's what you're going to get. So when somebody's not performing, that goes back to manager not doing their job, not creating a world of expectations, and then, then having a level of accountability for that representative. So there should be no surprise from that perspective. OK, yeah. I'm, go on, sorry, Ben. So I was just going to say, irrespective of this omni-channel approach, you know, if you've got a sales team, there is a, you know, and there is a moment where you need to be speaking to the customer in order to be able to create that trust differentiation, you know, sell yourself the company and the product, um, whether that was the cold calling or the customer calling into you. So, you know, so you still need to be improving, constantly improving your communication skills. And the problem is, is when you're living in a hybrid environment, you know, the self-learning is all great, you know, but practice makes permanence. And if you're practicing 
the wrong the wrong behaviors then you're you're embedding those wrong behaviors so how do we how do what well, the challenge for the managers is is to be able to coach in you know in the moment to observe that and provide that performance feedback so that they can improve improve their communication skills whether it's the cold calling or whether it's the inbound there still is a that that challenge is still there there still is a moment otherwise you just remove the sales teams altogether and it all becomes automated online okay so just going to bring in karen um so karen dunsquire from proficiently ceo proficiently hi karen hi, how you doing i'm really well how are you all sorry i'm late no problem, no problem. So we've just been talking about, um, you know, obviously training hybrid uh, hybrid workers. We've been touching on two main points, really, and I think one of it really comes down to, and what I was going to just come on to is KPIs and how are managers, you know, tracking and monitoring uh, the, the, the the KPIs of the of, of, of the, the sales executive and what KPIs are actually relevant and what are not. Um, and then I think the other one we, we, we were talking about, obviously, is that um, this self-training, self, 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 self self-development, um, how important is this for this day and age? And the last, last point, which I forgot, sorry, was that we're saying that, uh, you know, oh, I think it was a general consensus is that... Um, managers and leaders or leaders in general were just not equipped to understand and to deal with this kind of hybrid working um you know uh, you know topic yeah and, and how to deal with that do you have any comments on on, on any of those uh, three points yeah i absolutely do i think that um forgive me if any of these comments have been covered but you know the the work that we did throughout the period of 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 covid and lockdown um involved engaging specifically with leaders who were facing these challenges of engaging people within the hybrid working environment and i think it takes a combination of two very important things number one is a really high level of humanity a really good ability to engage with people and um, engagement with people is much easier when we are physically with them. So I think that managers have that huge evolution to make in order to be able to properly connect with human beings in a disconnected environment. So that skill set of leaders for sure require dialing up our ability to nurture, dialing up our ability to connect. Um, but then to the point around KPIs, I could, could not have be keen to put more emphasis on that point, Leon, really, because... KPIs historically have been metric numbers that indicate for us exactly how much is being delivered. And the KPIs that we needed to start bringing into the hybrid working environment were more about how and when and in what circumstances an individual is achieving. They needed to be much more softer KPIs, um, not just about the metrics, but about the input and behaviours behind the metrics. Um, and that requires excellent use of technology and excellent accountability. And I think getting those things right have been a really, really key focus. I don't know how everyone else um, feels about th those comments, but that's that's really what I've learned around um, that level of measurement that's really important. Can I jump in, um, Leon, and, and build on what Marcus in the stream is, has said, because I wholeheartedly support that. Marcus says, are we focusing on the wrong end of the problem? So much of this conversation is about tactics and not about understanding the customer. And on my little notepad that you can't see because you can only see my little vibrating, oscillating voice is three circles that I think are material to any sales engagement. There's the sales rep, whether you're SDR, BDR, AE. There's the customer, right? And there's the, the, the sales manager. Mm -hmm. The customer is the biggest circle and should be. And if the customer is a millennial or Gen Z, let's go back to, to that demographic, right? There's certain values and certain behaviors that they come to the party with. If we don't acknowledge that, mm -hmm. um, KPIs be damned. It's all about them, right? Yeah. And and if we don't acknowledge the, the, their how they want to engage. Because mm. we talked a little bit ago about the value of 100,000 a day. I don't know if that's still the case. I, I don't do 100,000 a day. 
But if phone is what the manager is saying, get on the phone, bucko, I want to see 50 dials a day, and the ideal customer that they serve doesn't pick up the phone, everything goes to voicemail, what's the point? Yeah. And I think I think that's I think that is the real, you know, episode what I'm trying to get at here is that, you know, the like you're saying it um and I think Marcus, we are this is not really about, you know, tactics. I mean, this is about, you know, what are what are the expectations we as managers have and how we pushing that onto our teams. You know, I think there are there's different types of customers, and I think we have to we have to be real, guys. There's still we still got our boomers. And they still want to be cool. They still want to have that interaction. They want to have that relationship with us. But then you have your Gen Z and then your, your, your Gen Z, and your Gen Y guys, whatever they're called. Um, and these guys, are, they're not going to pick up the phone. They want to be sitting there doing everything by text. And then I'm now starting to do voice notes with these guys because I can't text that fast. <laughs> you know? So everything's done by voice notes. But I've never spoken to these guys in my life. But I'm still closing deals with these guys. Because I understand that that's their communication method. Yeah. Can, can I ask a question? Is what this phone, this social selling, what role does content creation from the sales rep play in in engaging and nurturing relationship with a prospect? And is that part of this conversation? Is that a KPI that, that that's measured? Go on, Karen, you wanted to say... Yeah, I mean, I would say it very much does. You know, I, I loved your comments, Arthur. I think that, um, you know, for me, your customer experience and the quality with which that's carried out is the be-all and end-all. Um, and, of course, the more committed and engaged and motivated your employees are, the better quality customer service experience they will deliver. But that content creation is about my job as a SDR in an organization is to create a customer experience at such great quality that this customer buys into our offering, buys into our business. And if that means making a LinkedIn voice note, writing a great blog, creating a great video, you know, creating sound bites about exactly how we solve problems. I think that that's key. I think that giving our customers a diverse customer experience that's of high quality is my key objective. And yes, for sure, we should be measuring content and the quality of that. I think I think there's the, the notion that if we're doing 100 dials a day, that's filling the funnel yeah. at the top. If we're creating content, as an element in cooperation with the phone work, then I'm creating a flywheel because I'm attracting who I want to attract my ideal customer by talking about the need that they have and the, the way that I solve it. Yeah. That that flywheel begins. They might not bother me, but they might tell one of their colleagues over the fence at home, you know, you and I do the same kind of work. And I know you told me you have a challenge. And I've met this guy on LinkedIn that says he can fix it. Why don't you, I'll give you his LinkedIn profile. I'll forward it to you. Why don't you reach out and see if that guy can help you solve your problem? That only happened because of content creation and building an experience that seemed valid enough for that conversation to take place between those two neighbors. Hmm. Can I ask, could I sure. say something? Do, okay, um, maybe I am, I, I'm somebody that's always, always believed wherever, whatever team, I am managing and working with, um, one thing I've always said is that, guys, I'm not paying you for your time, I'm paying you for your results, yeah? I really do not care if you come in, you know, whatever time you come in or leave whatever time you leave, you know, you make two calls a day, if you make no calls in a month, I don't really care what your activities are. I want to see the results at the end of the day, yeah? That's what I'm gonna, that's what I'm gonna judge you on, yeah? Because you could make 200 calls, and be and hit your your KPIs, but you're still going to get fired at the end of the month if you don't hit, if you don't give me the results. And that results is the deals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for me, I I think you know I mean there is a, what is the purpose of these KPIs? Why are we even measuring them? And, and am I completely wrong in that? I mean I understand the KPIs are beneficial to understand maybe where a problem is and understand how to fix a problem. But in the same sense, are we focusing on the wrong things? 
So sure. Leo, if, Leon, if I could just pick pick up on that. So if you remember what Amir talked about is this people aren't making the numbers. So that's that's the that's the that's the that's the you know that's the reality of the situation. As for the metrics, yes, absolutely results. So what are the predictive measurable behavioral based metrics that will predictably lead to results? So the challenge is today is, is is we look at a lot of CRM stats, which are historical data, how many visits, how many calls, you know, and you know, and they're easy to measure and they are important to a certain degree, but, but they're very much quantitative and they're they're sort of lag measurements. What are the lead measurements, the behavioral based measurements that are lead to predictable behaviors that which lead to results? So those are the how do we create metrics around, you know, and some of those are you talked about content creation. You talked about, you know, on the phone. What we're talking about is skills. We are managers need to help develop skills within this new set of sales, which are you know, which are very diverse. You know, I need to be good at communicating, communicating across all channels, creating content, being on the phone, whether that's outgoing, outbound, or inbound. So to me, it's it's uh, it's the skills that. Uh, the managers need to help and prepare their teams for. And more than that, they don't need to be doing that in a bubble. They need to be practicing together and get, getting feedback because otherwise, if you don't get feedback, you can't improve. So those are the metrics that I think are really important to me. Okay. Uh, so, 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 yeah. Sorry, go on, go on, go on, Keith, go on. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm in, and I agree with, I think, with the metrics, the KPIs and those things. And I think directionally, we generally know what it, the, what it takes to make a sale. I feel like content okay. creation is kind of a different role. That's why we have marketing teams and some of these other teams to do those type of things. Uh, if you're asking a person to go out and make calls and do content content creation, I think you're going to have somebody that's not really sure about what they're supposed to be doing and the type of results that you're looking for, you're not going to yeah. get. I don't know that a, that a representative can be all things to everybody. And you have to make that determination. Yeah. What does this role require? What does Great. it take for somebody to be successful? I think that how about I think let's go back to go, let's go back to, to Leon's point, which is, you know, if if, if we have a a, a rep in Costa Rica, where Amir is, that I'm works ready. from 8 a.m. until noon and surfs in the afternoon and overachieves his plan. And yes. and that's the digital nomad from a decade ago. This is pre-pandemic, right? And you have one that you, you have in a cubicle that you look over the cubicle every hour to see if they're on the phone and they underwhelm their goals what are we rewarding? Are we rewarding the results? Or are we re we're rewarding our ability to time manage that individual? Um, and it's, and we're managing activities. We're not doing what Ben just articulated, which is training them up to be able to move to Costa Rica and be 200% of plan every month, every year. I mean, so it, it's skills development. I certainly, I think, I think is key. Moving away from the funnel and thinking about flywheel is another element that is a mindset change. Moving away from, um, I mean, I, I look at it this way. I mean, I, I'm a boomer. Uh, uh, I proudly say that I hung out with my grandson this weekend. So I've been around. And the world of selling has changed demonstratively. And, and I think the funnel, I, I won't say the funnel is dead and cold calling is dead, but the world has changed. And when I say the world has changed, the, the, the buyer, a decade ago, the buyer was the most powerful buyer on the planet. They didn't need salespeople until the last step in the sales cycle. Because I could find all the answers by Googling what I need to know about the problem I'm trying to solve. It, and so if we don't acknowledge the, the yes. changes, we, and, and I think in, many, in large part, I, I think Gong is, is the new Uber meaning that the SDRs of today are training Gong how to do their job. And that job of the SDR and all those dials will be done in an automated fashion in the not too distant future. So training them up to have the skills that are above just doing dials is material to, to serving the customer in, in, in the proper way, in my opinion. Gordon Mayer, what did you want to say? Osri is a man. I'm in, I'm in Colombia, not Costa Rica, but Costa Rica is beautiful. And I've been there. I, 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 like, I don't sort of like think. 
<laughs> so I'm not, I'm not much of a surfer, but I, I appreciate you bringing up Gong because that's that's where I was going, right? I, I think I think where I think where training is going is specialization. I think what people forget is that yeah. when a VC gives the money like to a company like Gong, and I met with Gong many years, many times. Uh, I use Chorus personally. Um, same thing. They, they rush to hit metrics to make venture capital companies happy, which are growth top line numbers, right? And they get these tools in the hands of people. They're charging 25K, 30K. Companies really budget for the tools. They don't budget for the use of the tools. Like I have Chorus and how, how often do you think I use it, right? Like like who's, who's coaching our calls? Like nobody, right? So I think where I think where training's going, it's going to start going towards companies actually getting the budget for a, a person to actually sit down and coach a call. Because I'm like, if you do the math, if you have a hundred thousand dollar average contract value and you have a conversion rate of ten percent, and now you convert it to twenty percent, well, if you added a million dollars revenue with ten million dollar valuation and you double that, it's a lot. You, you've added another ten million dollars, so now you can get a budget for sixty k. So I think in the future. We're going to have um, more specialized positions that are solely to train, solely to coach, or maybe agencies, maybe maybe professional consultants that can plug in with Gong and specialize. But I think I think companies trying to do it all in house is a weird thing because I think a lot of SaaS companies, you know, what I heard from software companies when I used to be a service company for outsource sales, which we're now a marketplace, was they would tell me all the time, "Amir, we don't outsource," and. I don't think they actually really realized that SaaS is outsourcing. Like, I don't think they even fundamentally understood that they were telling companies don't build a technology in house, pay out, pay a monthly fee for it, which is outsourcing. And I think they were so defensive to lose their positioning or their power by hiring an outsourced sales consultant, an agency, a trainer that they tried doing it all themselves. And I think in the future, you're going to have companies that work with services that plug in the gong, that just coach, and people will be allowed to do what they do best, right? A good VP of sales that has 20 years experience, maybe they're very good at negotiating seven figure deals down to 12 o'clock at night on a Q1, right? But like, is that person gonna be really good at using gong every day? Should they be? Probably not. So to author, appreciate you bringing up, I, I, I wouldn't say that gong would be the Google, um, because that's a that's a it's a it's a big it's a big a big you know big fish to target. But I would say that um, they will change the future of training by allowing companies to specialize and allowing companies to plug into services that specialize so they can do what they do best. Um, and once again, it's like four in the morning here, so I'm hoping to choose everybody. I, my no, but I, I think this is a very good point because I think this topic of specialization now, and I think Keith, you mentioned it. Are we? Do we need? one person to do everything and i'm and i and i i don't agree with that i'm sorry i really don't agree with that i've had i have a team you know where, where i've been training up sales guys but all the way from behind there feeding those sales guys i've had marketers and they've been behind the scenes creating content because i realized that content was very key to helping the sales guys sell but i never decided to ever try and train my sales guys to create content i i, I tried it i tried it i hated it, it, it it's <laughs> annoying it's sitting there for two hours trying to think of it some of the post to, to write and then you write it and then you're, you're trying to tweak it that's like three hours of my day gone why when I can just get a marketer to do that you know and even a junior marketer they can do that in like 10 minutes and they can create the break the best post and it gets more engagement than the one i spent three hours doing so i'm like why i think specialization is very very key here guys look we have we have a certain job to do as leaders but that job does not need to be does not need to be one person does to do the whole 360 of that job they can a job be broken down into many different parts and those, all those different parts will be done by various specialists within the organization. And collectively, as a team, we can achieve our goal. What are you guys' thoughts on that? How, how, about, how about the best sales guy in 2023, the best sales woman or man in 2023 has marketing skills, and that's who I hire to teach them how to sell. Because if we agree that content is king, and, and as a consumer, 
I only respond to the brands that provide an experience that have the values that I have. And if I don't know what your values are and you don't provide me with experience, I'm going to somebody who does. Because in this world of, in the digital world that we live in where you can make things sing and dance on my screen and, and bring me value at the same time, that's what I'm looking for. And if, if you need two people to do that, to get my attention, why not hire the person that can get my attention with the great content that they produce, whether it's video, audio, or text, and teach but them how to sell. But you're assuming, you're assuming that that's the only, that's the only buyer that is just that they're, yeah. they're looking for, for, for content. You know what I mean? I, I can tell you yeah. Germany now is a, a country where, you know, the, the, <clears throat> the most people who own the businesses are still boomers. Mm -hmm. yeah, and they are not necessarily so active on LinkedIn. They're not necessarily so following these content. They're not really interested in that stuff because yeah. that's not their generation. Well, I, I think also that sometimes it's not even their business. I mean, mm -hmm. ultimately, across the world, you have a lot of these mid to small size companies. Yeah. They don't have budget. They don't have time. They need reps to get on the phone, make calls, hit the field, you know, do those things. So, I mean, for some people, what we're talking about is not even – it's not even on their radar because it's just not, it's just not practical for them to yeah. uh, I, I'm, I'm working in a manu I'm working in manufacturing. I'm working in engineering. Yeah. I'm not sure the content creation for them is important. It's important. It's not important now. And I think well, it's having a variety of different skills to feel a different market. Go on, Karen. And then Ben. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Ben. <laughs> Um, I think I think the thing we need to be super clear about here is what we mean by content creation. Now, content creation is not, you know, if you need a web page building or you need a white paper writing, that's the job of a marketing department. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's true in any business of any size. But I do think that, you know, we are aware that technology is enabling us to be much more efficient at, at sales stage. Um, we are aware that, you know, we, we have a bit of a, a race to the top at the moment. A truly excellent SDR or sales executive or whatever job title you're giving them is a world class communicator. They are able to take a customer on a journey from prospect to customer really effectively they're able to do that with a multitude of different buyer buyer profiles they're able to do that with a multitude of different communication styles and if i need to use a linkedin audio message or i need to you know craft a really great post or i need to create a video or i need to write an email or i need to use the telephone I need to be able to do all of those things well. I need to be able to articulate my company's message in the best way possible because I need to be a good enough communicator to nurture relationships. And I think that those all-rounders are the guys who are going to, or girls, to Arthur's point, um, are, who are going to be the ones that are going to be truly successful. Um, and one-trick ponies who can make a great phone call but can't do anything else um, will, will not rise to the top, I don't think. That would be my opinion. Can, can mm -hmm. I build on what Karen just said and, and suggest that the, the power is is still in the hands of the buyer? And, and you know, we, we all know KLT, the acronym is no like and trust. I think that there's a miss, a, there's a myth about no like and trust. I used to go into, into to, to executive uh, offices and look at the credenza, see the lovely picture of their family and comment on that wanting to be liked because I like their family. That's bogus. I only buy things from people, and I think I'm not unique. I buy things from people that have authority, that I can trust, that I, if I spend a thousand or $10,000, that they're not gonna, it's gonna be a good spend because they come with authority, they show some kind of leadership and I'm willing to follow them to buy it from them. And if you don't have authority, I'm not doing business with you. I'm going to wait until I find a salesperson that does and the business that thinks that that's important for my engagement. And the only way I know you have authority is if you personally can tell me why you're in this business, why you're successful in this business and what you know about this business that can help me and my business. And that's content so, creation. That's brand. That's a brand strategy that is an individual endeavor. If you don't have a brand and I don't know who you are, you're just carrying a bag. I need counsel and consulting, I need authority and I need leadership. And that's why, you know, the old challenger sale that has the relationship builder, the problem solver, the challenger, 
I think the leader is the new salesperson. If you can't lead, then you can't really deliver me value. But, go on. I, I got a question for the group. If go, I can, go, on, go ahead. Can Evan. I ask? Or did I cut somebody off? No, oh, go, on, go on, go on, go on. So if, if the bridge group states that the average SDR lasts, what is it, 1.2 years this time? 1.2 years? Yeah. Well, yeah. These are facts. It's, da it's data, right? It's probably worse than that. Mm -hmm. Why would companies want to invest in training SDRs if that's the state? Like why? Right. There's an old saying, and I forgot who, uh, who quoted it. It's like, you know, you're, 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 you're afraid of training people because they're going to leave your company, but you should be more fearful of, mm -hmm. of having someone working for you that's untrained, right? But I think one of the biggest problems is that we forgot to tell you that the data is there that they're leaving. So I think a lot of leaders are hesitant to invest in the training because they've seen the churn in SDR. So they're just kind of like hit the bones, get it done fast, right? And they kind of want to flush them out that way. Um, mm -hmm. I think fundamentally something is broken <laughs> that's much I mean, deeper. I, 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 I want to just comment on this. I mean, the question was, how are leaders managing the development of junior sales resources in a hybrid working mm -hmm. environment? Now, we've been talking about training here a lot, yeah? Now, but there is other ways to develop. Like, I mean, I know that there's, um, so for example, AWORKS, and they are um, in, they're, they're in group three, Adele. They're, they're AWORKS, they're in group three. Now, they focus really on company culture. It is all about the company culture. And I've never really seen a company so infused and so enthusiastic about company culture, but it works. It works, you know, having a, a, a creating a culture for hybrid workers, yeah, that, you know, it really makes them feel like they're part of something much bigger. We're talking, we're talking mm -hmm. about the development and I never said anything about training. I've said development. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was the question. I think we need to, yeah. So whatever ways we got, we've got, we've got about 20, we've got about uh, 20 minutes left. Mm -hmm. What other ways do we think, let's move away from the training topic. Mm -hmm. What other ways do we think that we leaders should be inspiring the development of hybrid workers, junior? So, workers? so Leon, let, let me just come in here and say, um, for me, the, <clears throat> the managers are the, are the, the fulcrum here, you know, okay. um, they are. So when you go into, uh, when I've gone into big organizations and I say, you know, do you have, co do you do coaching in your culture? Yeah, they do. And, but what happens is, is they're coaching. We're talking to the top leaders, the top of the triangle, people are getting coached you know, the, the top management, but that's not where the, the biggest lever of performance in any organizations are the first line managers. So the first line managers are, they have the, if we enable them, we give them the, the tools, we support them uh, and, and upskill them and they will drive the performance. I think Gartner says that, you know, an effective manager coach drives performance by up to 26%. And also, you know, the great resignation, it, reduce, it reduces the turnover by, by 20%. So if we're talking about SDRs, you know, if we're if we're if we're coaching them effectively, then we should get that talent retention. So then they can turn into a commercial AE and then into a an enterprise AE if that's the, the path. You know, that should be that should be the path that we're looking when we bring an SDR on to take them on that journey. Because you know, because people don't people generally don't want to stay an SDR all their life. Some people do because they think they can make a lot of money, but they're unicorns. And um, but most people want want to evolve. So to me, the the key 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 point here is is we need to we need to support skill up because as I said earlier on, f over fifty percent of managers they are sort of they've been the as uh, they've been the, the the single you know the contribution person out in the field. They've been tapped on the shoulder, you know, um, and said you know, you're now a manager. They haven't been given the skills. We don't know whether they're the right people they're often very selfish because that's what made them successful and now we're asking them to change their role we haven't necessarily given them all the tools and the support to help help them and if we could really that's where the most efficient focus i think could be and then and then get them focusing on how they can coach their their hybrid teams uh, can i i'll, int I'll introduce a, a, a novel idea but i think there's there's some truth in it is that if we look out into the future five years and we ask ourselves what's technology going to do to all the jobs on the planet sdrs and bdrs how will they be different in the future with the the, the pace of the way technology is advancing 
AI, machine learning, big data, um, will the role of that we're discussing today be different? And I say, yes, it will be radically different because technology is going to be doing some of those tasks. If that's true, then the humans that are in the roles that humans still want to do business with humans, to Ben's point, if we don't give them the skills to do that job, because the menial task, I mean, I think Keith was saying earlier that, you know, if you, you're working with a, a company that's in manufacturing, they don't have time for to read content. I, I think that if those jobs are going to be Amazon out of existence, because if it's a transaction, then I can get that transaction handled like in an Amazon kind of buy. I don't need a salesperson for that. I, I can just go find it. I'll research it. I'll find it. I'll buy it. When I need somebody to guide me and lead me, um, I think that is part of the EQ becomes more important than IQ. And the tech, the TQ is going to be doing a lot of the heavy lifting. And all that's left for us to do in 2023 and four and five is going to be to lean into our human skills. And you don't get to lean into your human skills until your leadership teaches you how to use those human skills to drive business. Okay, we've been talking about this topic of leadership here. What? Let me, let me rephrase the question. What can we do then? Because we're going to. Sum, I want to summarize this now. We've got 10, 10, 15 minutes. What can we? What can we do as leaders to become to to better lead our workers? Because I think this is we, we, we're saying everybody that leadership is the fulcrum here. That is the real core part of this. How can we empower our customers to be better leaders, especially when we're talking about our internal customers, our, sure. our workers, yeah? So I, I would say... Everybody, everybody give a point, yeah? yeah. So what would you say? How could you, how could you start? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, when people get promoted into management, you got to train them. And at the end of the day, you need to have some type of management leadership development program. Uh, Gallup has these, you know, seven most effective skills of the most effective uh, manager. I don't remember all of them off the top of my head, but one of them is relationship building. Those relationships between the rep and the manager are so important. The most important relationship that you have in any organization is with the manager. So the data is there. Unfortunately, a lot of organizations don't have a structured management development program or even a way to train somebody from once they are promoted into that position so consequently people do exactly what they were doing when they were representatives that made them successful so i think if you start there and then you add that consistent coaching then i think better outcomes happen and better results and all of the things that we talked about uh, begin to happen once you train the managers more effectively and make sure that there's a structured program okay karen what would you what's your what's your opinions on this Leon, thank you so much. I think that um, I probably have a, an insight just in terms of my experience um, through the lockdown period that, that might tie in everyone's comments around development training, your reference to culture. Um, we did a large project over, over lockdown, and I'll keep this as brief as possible, which was called the Lockdown Leaders Project, where we did assessment of over 100 different organisations in the UK to understand what their leaders were doing that made a difference to how successful they were. And we identified that the businesses that were really holistic about leadership were the ones that were doing the best job. And let me explain what I mean by that. Um, rather than thinking about management or coaching or leadership or culture as individual things, they had a really holistic and joined up vision of how they managed their employee journey, often in a very strategic and well-planned way, thinking about from the very moment we attract a candidate, how do we recruit them? How do we induct them? How do we offer them progression? How do we manage them? How do we give them recognition? Thinking about from the day they first experience our business, right through to the point when they are ending their career with our business, how do we maximize the experience that they have with us? How do we treat them as we would our external customer? And that is about all of these things. That is about looking at all of the touch points of the customer's interaction, of the employee's interaction with your business and making sure they're world class. And it isn't about a piece of leadership or a KPI management. It's about a really holistic thing that says, you know, your business is a community of human beings. 
if you treat it as such, then it will thrive. And so it's about analyzing the entire end-to-end -end journey as we would regularly do with our customers, yeah. but doing that for our employees and making Absolutely. sure that the environment that we create for them allows them to, to really perform. And that's what I think um, really, really great businesses that are full of great leadership skills do, in my opinion. Yeah. Definitely. Can I build on what Karen said, Leon? And I think it's an important point. And it's, you know, sometimes what's, sometimes what's, what's, what's old is new again. And uh, there's a thing called the Malcolm Baldwich Award from the last century. It's that, that old. It's from the 80s, I think, Malcolm Baldrige. And Fortune 100 companies followed it a lot. And they would award, they would win the award because they followed a thing called leadership through quality. And that was the first time I heard the internal and external customer term used. Internal customer is your employees. And if you care about your employees, the internal customer as much as you care about the external customer. And then everything that you do to support that internal customer is a quality opportunity. Hmm. Then when the secretary is handing a report to Leon, she knows that it's her job to do her absolute best to produce a quality product. So Leon then gets it and produces a quality product that he hands to the customer. And it becomes a culture of quality yep. that's built on the leadership that says we have, we're making space for quality in our organization, not just for our customers that we serve, but the internal customers that make things happen. Yep. And, and that is a way to back into coaching because if you make quality, job number one internally or in the organization, then how do I how do I make space for doing a hundred dials and then assuring that this proposal that I'm sending out the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed? Well then you make space for the things and that's what coaching is really all about. Coaching is nothing but holding space for doing the right things at the right time. And that's what coaches do for their coaches. That's great. Right, sorry, sorry, guys, we've got literally eight minutes left. So Amir and Ben, I just want to hear your opinions and then we just, we just, just tie this up. So how would you, um, going back to the question, how would you uh, empower your customers uh, to be better leaders? Amir, do you want to go? Or do you, uh, I'll have, I I'll have go first. So. Uh, so I come back to this point is we need to invest in the managers. You know, that to me, I just keep coming back to, sorry for, for that, mm -hmm. but it's, yeah. you know, we, you know, in, in, and we need to elevate them. We need yeah. to treasure them. We need mm -hmm. to, we need to provide the sales teams, the support in the field when they need it, where they need it. This means not only providing the sales support material, you know, so that they can, you know, that just in time, but also that in moment skills, practice and coaching to make sure that the marketing investment, you know, that, that brought the customer to a face to face conversation. Okay, we've lost Ben, I think. I'm here. Okay, go on. We, we, uh, you yeah, sorry, so I just want to say, so, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the best sales practice with purpose and the rest practice on the customer. So I'd like us just to challenge this train and forget model, you know, and transform that learning with meaningful practice and feedback in the field where it counts. Brilliant. That's great. Amir, last last point, and I'm just going to sum up. Yeah, so, and I'll echo similar things, just making making the right investments, making the right the right investments in the time it takes to consume it, and, and just leading from above. You know, sharing, mm -hmm. right? Like if you're if you're trying to have a, a training culture, but you're a leader who's not actually gone through the training yourself, probably setting a bad example. So I think just people who go through the training, share it, right? Like I have a, I have a chief operating officer named Tony Dix, and. I, as the CEO, I'm, I'm getting training lessons every day at three in the morning on my phone. So he just took Nathan Laka's course um, and he's literally from the top down, um, you know, pegging training. And this is a guy who went through Eli Lilly's training. So he went to, he went to uh, Kellogg MBA. So I just think by, you know, not just giving a budget, but actually consuming yourself and, 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 and putting it down would be the best way that I've seen. Hard to ignore that, you know. Yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, so, just from my from my perspective, I I, I really um, really really empathise with uh, you know Karen's point, and this is something that I take to heart. So, one of the things that I do within SMCs, and whenever I I get a new employee, I ask them like treat them like my customers. I call them my internal customers and my external customers. I treat them like customers. What is your vision? 
what is your dream? What did, where do you want to go? And at first they all think it's a trick question. They want to tell me, oh yeah, I want to do this, get up in management. Okay. No, no, forget SMC. What do you personally want to achieve? There is no right or wrong answer. And then after a bit, they'll come out, you know, well, I really want to do this. I really want to do it. Okay, great. Now let's break this down. You know, so one of the, just to give you one example, my marketing director, she said, look, my ambition, I really want to run an orphanage for, for kids, you know, in 10 years time. I said, okay, great. Listen, let's break this down. You know, you want to run an orphanage. What does that involve? You're going to need leadership skills. You're going to need, you're going to need to be able to, um, your management skills. You're going to need these and these and these skills. Okay, now if we break that down, so if I'm going to give you, I'll give you leadership training, management training. I'll give you then what I need from you, and we're going to break it down. And we created a five-year plan of how we was going to get her to the point. And I said, oh, and one of the things was capital. So we said, look, you need to, we're going to pay you some money. You need to put aside 10% of your money every month and save it up. And basically helped her to achieve her dream and put a plan in place that helps her to achieve her dream. That she created loyalty it, she's one of my hardest workers you know and i did that for all of my employees and that's something that i do because i have i try to get away from this notion that look these guys are going to be with me for life or i'm, I'm going to know an employee is for a season let's, let's get real here guys you know one two years three years if you're lucky whatever but like karen said let's make that the best experience for them as possible why because they're going to refer you just like your normal customers would You'll get referrals. You'll get up and cross selling opportunities. You'll get all these other opportunities that come back from it. And I think start treating your employees like your customers. Yeah. And as a leader, we serve our employees. Yeah. We serve. We serve our customers. We should serve our employees. And I think if you start taking that kind of stance. You know, we're gonna be. You're gonna be successful, guys. Um, I want to thank you all for coming to this debate today and thank you all for your time uh just so you know so the the, the debate will continue today uh, if anybody has any questions for the speakers um i'm hoping all of them are going to be there i know some of them won't be there but as many of them will be there as possible we'll be in a networking room between 3 40 and 420 yeah 3 40 and 420 and they'll be sitting there be able to answer any personal one-to-one -one questions for you guys i hope you enjoyed uh, the debate and i hope you learned a lot from it uh, see you in about 10 minutes we, we have a quick break see you at uh 11 50 for the next debate thank you guys thank you bye. very much thank you thank you bye bye now